you for coming this morning. I, as Norman said, I, my disclaimer up front is I am not a health uh, care professional, but I am a, an avid user of health and wellbeing services. Um, so I look very much from the consumer's perspective, but I spend my life really navigating uh, where the world is going. So if we look a little bit of my, I, I like to start with, um, as Norman says, you know, really your wellness or your ability to navigate in this world is all about, you know, how you get out of bed every morning. It's like I call it. I get out of bed every morning for a very strong why. I've lived most of my life offshore. I grew up at Upper Mount Cravat here in Brisbane. I have seven brothers, one of which is in the audience somewhere today. Hello, Stephen. Um, and uh, I get out of bed every morning because I spend a long time offshore helping corporations make a lot of money and creating great new value, creating great new discoveries and bringing those to market. But I wanted to live amongst my tribe and twice I've done that. I came back from New York and lived here in Brisbane for about four years, got an MBA, uh, actually went to Canberra and inside of Prime, uh, Prime Ministers and Cabinet wrote one of the first conceptual maps of how we might deliver outcomes-based welfare systems where we join the whole government up and put the customer at the centre of it. That was 16 and a half years ago and we're finally seeing tiny little fragments of that come to place. That was universal wages, it was um, you know, care that had a frontline assistant to navigate it, it joined up departments, it got rid of the idea that it was 176 programs. So that was the kind of conceptual thinking I did. I then went to the Middle East for nine years and um, did most of my work inside of sovereign wealth funds and understanding how they leveraged money globally and locally to create a sense of well-being and a create a sense of um, not just physical wealth, but what does it mean to be wealthy and prosperous as a society. Um, so my why is I, I, have, I understand that we are in this unique position that you know, the game has profoundly changed. And the very things that sent me offshore um, you know, twice in my career for the last 30 years, actually now I don't need to do. I can do those same practices right here and I can create global change sitting in my tribe in a lifestyle and a well-being that really maximizes my life potential. So that's how I get out of bed every day. I get out of bed to really help Australians use technology to create globally significant enterprises that will create, and I don't use the word uh, work, I use the word participation. The world is about participating. You know, the fact that some of that participation is rewarded with cash is actually not the important part. The important part is we participate. And as we move through some new models, you'll see that participation becomes a big theme. I want to create wealth, and that's a sense of wealth of my individual wealth, my community. Um, wealth is a, is a sense, it's not necessarily a cash balance in the bank account. Well-being is impeccably important. We're here in the, in the scheme of things of an incredibly short amount of time. So why should we not do that with our best selves? And I want to create that in a sustainable future. So this is not a flash in the pan, an internet bubble. This is about how do we use these new trends that are moving to actually create a whole different frame. And in healthcare, as in other industries, this is really about embracing a very systems thinking. We're not going to get to where we need with incremental change. We need to profoundly rethink the models that will deliver you know, our sense of health, but our education systems, how we think about work and participation, how, we, how our, as an economy we're going to function. So that's pretty much where I spend my time and I send it across a number of areas. You can see some of the roles I do. Um, I, my sense of well-being comes from finding pockets to help shift mindsets at a strategic level so we can get systems change. So I do that by providing um, board directorships. So I sit on some, some government boards, um, unpaid mostly, so that I can help move the system that often confrains us by their regulatory prime frame. Um, I also sit on a number of boards that then fund the new economy. So I sit on venture capital boards that help seed capital into these new discoveries and, and new ways of thinking, and also helping transform some of our existing structures, because that's really important. I invest actively, so I personally put my own money into ventures to help grow them. And then I also coach. So as a talent coach, I, I look and uh, to hope to find talent here in Australia, which we do, but I also attract talent here because it's in that wonderful mix of getting people like uh, our friend Mama to come back and help us um, be great. So that's a little bit about why I get out of bed every day. What's more importantly is what's driving this change in economy. You know, I think there's a lot of fear in the, in the descriptions I see. Um, I don't usually participate in the regular media, but I see if I occasionally drop into a commercial television network during the news cycles, I see a lot of fear. And if I ever read a news corporation newspaper, I tend to see a lot of, a lot of fear. Uh, but the real change we're seeing is we're really moving from 
the industrial age, I guess, into what we're calling this innovation age, the digital age. I don't really mind what we call it, but it's profound. And it's really driven by technology. But really the change is, if you think about the industrial age, which a lot of our, our um, bureaucratic structures like health have been completely anchored in. That was all about scale. You know, Who works in a hospital system where they say, if we only had 20 more beds, then we could amortize that cost and we could get another one of these. You know, It was all about how do I scale? Things had to be at scale. Australia was often told, as I was, oh, you can't start that business here. There's not enough customers. You'll never make money, right? So it was about, but now in the new economy, it's not so much about scale, it's about speed. So how do I actually take that discovery, escalate it through its process and get it to marketplace to have impact? Location used to be critical. You had to be in New York if you wanted to trade. You had to be in London if you wanted to be in banking. Uh, you had to be in Paris if you wanted to be in fashion. Um, now what we're finding is it's connectivity. So I can be anywhere. I'm helping you know, fashion designers in Brisbane uh, do virtual runway shows around the world and they're getting orders on the back of that and creating value and they're not leaving um, their local location. So the technology is in enabling this sense of location shift. Competition. You know, that used to be the war cry and still is of a lot of big corporate papers. I read the AFR and often it's about who beat who. Our politics is about who beat who. The new world, and that's why sometimes the Gen Ys and people that, are, that spend a lot of time in the new economy look back, hello, how are you? <laughs> yeah, you feel it too, right? Let's collaborate on that. <laughs> um, they want to collaborate because they actually see the energy we place into competing to be lost energy and waste. So how do we work out how we collaborate to improve the impact? And that's a really big driver of one of the values of the new economy and people that participate. Absolutely, the cheer squad of the old economy was economic capital. And I see that every day. What is the, what is the dollar doing? What is our GDP? We're, you know, we're using these very hard, old-fashioned economic measures. But, you know, I drove someone's kids to school this morning, right? I exchanged value with that person, but nowhere does that appear on our national accounts. You know, someone goes and works on a not-for-profit board and, and gives their time and expertise to uplift that organisation. That doesn't appear in our national accounts. So what we're seeing now is it's really moving from economic capital to human capital because capital will follow talent. So if you remember one thing today is actually preserve your talents in this room and really think about how you're managing talent in the new economy. It used to be very products driven. I want to buy this, now it's experience. I want to experience and, and move through. And often the product is not purchased at all in that process. You can see some of the other aspects there. The profound change as we describe it is we're going from the economy of corporations Right, where efficiency was important and it was deep in analysis. Who's worked in a hospital system where they go, oh, let's get some consultants in? We need to analyse that. It was deep into analytics. What we're seeing in the new economy is it's personalised. So I walk in, I've, told, I've shared some information. You as the tax department or you as the health department have learnt a lot about me over the years that I've been on this earth. Could you please not present that back to me in some usable form to the vendors that might be interacting with me in my daily work? No, we, we, we file it away in, in privacy legislations. It used to be about cost, it's now about revenue, but in the health system it's not so much about revenue, it's about output. So we, let's not focus on what it costs, let's focus on what we actually derive as value at the end of it. And the other one is it's design intensive. And that sounds a bit flowery, like I'm, you know, we're going to sit here and draw pictures or sketch. But actually design just means we think deeply about what is the experience that the human at the centre of this process wants to go through. And that experience means transforming maybe some physical attributes of unwell to well, but also what is the emotional experience? You know, what is the setting we should be doing this in? What is a place that will make that person's biology its best to enable them to participate as a partner in this journey around being journey to uh, to a better well-being state? So it profoundly changes the process of how we design. Here's a few examples of, and I'll make my slides available, so you know, oh, happy to email them out. Um, these just show a few of the elements that are helping us drive. Mobile, definitely the phone. You know that 90% of, of homeless people have a mobile phone. Um, and we've just launched a project in Brisbane called Share My Data, which will allow people like myself that often don't use all my data to share it with homeless people. So we now have even, you know, often the most disenfranchised or people we think are outside the loop are actually quite connected. And that's a really valuable tool for us because we now know we can connect. Um, <clears throat> You know, my good friend Jack Walsh says, if the rate of change outside exceeds the rate of change inside, then the end is near. And sadly, my experience is, as I journey through the health system is that kind of the rate of change outside and inside, we need to do some massive transformations. 
Here's some of the ways in terms of the work I do at the university for a day a week. We try and describe what, what are some elements, because we don't want to just talk big picture. How do I take this back to my work and do some things? So if you look at the customer side, we talk about it's being driven by what's your ability to gain digital attention. Right, so how do you get into my phone or one of my screens that I, I seek information from, my watch, my phone, um, and how do you penetrate that with information? In the old days, we used to do like lots of brochures. We were laughing here today about, <clears throat> I went for my annual checkup with my GP the other day, and I was just floundered by it. It was one of those last places where you get brochures. <laughs> and I went in the door and there was like this massive thing of brochures, and I went through and looked at all these different brochures, and I thought, I wonder who picks up those brochures and what happens with them? Because it's really not a way that I get my information anymore, and I'm in a certain when I I work at the university, very few students would pick up a brochure. They might actually pick up, I did see one kid walk in and he picked the brochure up and he took a photo of it and then he put the brochure back, <laughs> which is kind of nice for our environment, right? <laughs> um, digital signals. So that's the other thing about how am I getting my signals every day. You know, I'm working on a project at the moment about personalised transportation where I'm willing to give someone my calendar and say, so then just tell me what mode, how I'm going to turn up. And so it sent me a little message at 7 o'clock this morning and said, here's your three options about how you can journey to your place today. Here's what you need to wear. Um, you don't need an umbrella because we're not expecting it to rain. Uh, and then it journey maps me through. It's giving me little signals about you know, where I could. Uh, and when I choose that signal, the GPS picks me up and goes, oh, OK, she's driving. I can see that. So it then gives me a new signal. So it's interesting. And from a health perspective, how could we help people not just in that 15-minute you know, consultation of the GP, but how might we see some of that that um, the digital signals continue throughout my daily life. Uh, so some of those I've outlined, we're not going to have time for those today, but this really gives, I guess, a next layer down description of some of the things in health um, that we may well uh, look at. And the important thing there is some of the principles that we use to design, um, if you like, engagement models uh, with clients or people that are in interested in systems change, is it has to be systems thought. Okay. At the moment, we're thinking, okay, I'm a GP, has my remit, so we're going to give you a regulation that fits within the box that says, what does a GP do? But actually, the reality is, a GP is part of a very big system that helps try and move um, lots and lots of people through um, a complex, highly unstructured system that sometimes works at odds with its very self. And the funding models often do not support the behaviour that we truly as practitioners know we want our clients and, and people to uplift. So that's where systems thinking needs to come in. We need to think through, OK, I know this is not in my remit, but this is in education or it's sitting in transportation or it's sitting in urban planning and design. But you know, somewhere we need to wake up to ourselves. And I'm seeing those groups form now. So at the university, we open up quite a few what we call thinking circles. And we bring together all of those disparate people and talk about, oh, OK, how might we plan the design of our cities to enable better well-being? And what does well-being mean? Can someone give me four measures of if I'm going to plan around well-being, if I'm going to plan transportation networks or education systems or work participation schemes, what does well-being look like in all of those and how do they join up? Good morning. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> OK. Um, just to give you an example, there is really very interesting things happening in Queensland. I have a theory about why we're doing, we're patching above our weight here, and that's because I think we're a very big kind of country town community. We all, we, it's only one or two calls or degrees of separation. And that village-like atmosphere that my friends in Sydney and Melbourne like to laugh at actually is the very thing that will allow us to lead in a very humble, quiet, warm and generous way like Queenslanders like to in a lot of these sectors around health and wellbeing and participation. You know, we currently have um, over 800 people that regularly turn up at what we call a Brisbane Health Tech Meetup. And through those collaborations, you know, the person that's got some great front end tech meets a hospital administrator that's got a problem and they connect together and little projects get spawned. Amory Liddy's group and Checkup, we started working together three years ago. It's a wonderful node of innovation because it brings diversity together and you can start to get this systems thinking done at your level, regardless of what the bigger system of a hospital or, or the, the government is doing. We can make real change with small projects here that will lead to bigger transformation changes as we go. Here's some great startups. You know, Fit Genes is a company that's doing genome um, work and it's very controversial because obviously now there's a bit of a challenge about what sort of practitioners need to do those things. We just had a discussion at the state government level about, you know, should, you know, it's hypothetical, but should the government invest in a whole genome platform and make it a freeware so that any practitioner that wants to come in with an API can start to look at, you know, okay, what would that mean for me or what does that mean for different aspects of it? So we're having some interesting discussions at a very big level. Victor's Health is a wonderful story. Two little, two um, stay-at-home mums from the, from the north 
North Coast, uh, one of which his child had extreme, um, what looked like uh, some sort of a, a rash on her face. She had 82 consultations with that child until she hit an integrated doctor that said, I think there's something in this girl's gut. The 82 practitioners all did external treatments, laser, gave her creams, nothing happened over a three year window. She hit the integrated doctor, they did one gut sample and in three weeks with removing some elements of, from that diet, um, the, the rashes disappeared and wellbeing was restored. That mum and her best friend said, never again will I let any one other mother go through what I went through. And they started that day three years ago designing a database that just helped um, their friends of circles in a, in a little Excel spreadsheet work out what elements were, were, were causing different diseases and create an elimination. We will help them raise $5 million next week and we'll take them to New York in October and they'll look to raise $50 million. They have, the, they have worked tirelessly on this awesome database that allows a practitioner, at the moment it's mostly nutritionists but it could be a wider range, put in a bunch of uh, health issues and bring out a, uh, a, a plan, a shopping list, some recipes um, in a digital format. It can also do um, actually send a signal to a diet uh, to a food provider. So if a light and easy wanted to actually do a personalised diet, you could do that. Major transformations for and, and groundbreaking, interesting um, stuff. Genomity is being bought. That's a local Brisbane startup that is like a tree that you hang your disparate bits of wellbeing data on. It comes together in one place and it helps make some sense of my Fitbit, my pathology, my eating plan, my diet, my exercise. I know I'm running short of time, I always do. Five minutes, thank you. Okay, um, this just gives you an idea of what we're um, opening here in Queensland in terms of thinking circles. These are complex issues and they don't get resolved in five minutes or a workshop or four people. It, you know, there needs to be some unpacking. So we like to open up what we think is over the horizon thinking and then introduce and invite disruptive thinkers and people that have no domain knowledge in these sectors sometimes at all and then bring domain professionals in at different points to, to valet check. Some of those ones are things like um, lifestyle as a service. So currently we, a lot of us buy software as a service. So I have a monthly service. So I don't, in the olden days you'd have to go and hire someone load something up with a disk on my computer, now I just buy it by the month. So we're looking at what might lifestyle as a service mean to our community? So could I buy food, clothing, shelter, healthcare and mobility and entertainment as a monthly service fee from a provider? And you could do that at all different levels of income. So at the high level, it might be, you know, I want to do six months in Paris and here's what I want to do. Um, it, at the other le level, how do we actually transform our welfare system? So instead of it being, let's give you less and less money to go and try and survive food, clothing, shelter, participation, but actually let's look at what lifestyle at, um, at our most basic level to actually help you to be a participant in our society might look like. And there's some really great innovation going on at, at all of those levels. Also, there's a big impact for that on super annuation funds because we really are saying that in the future you know a lot of the stress is going to come I'll get the money but then I spend the next 40 years of my life worrying if that's enough money to keep me in the state that I want to buy food clothing shelter and health care so why wouldn't the super fund actually buy those assets and provide those as an endless service for me so it's, it involves the sharing economy it involves a couple of themes the other one is digitally enabled human contact and we spoke quickly about that last night over dinner. And this is a big driver. You know, I often find um, people in um, caring and health services, these are human services. And I think at some level we have sometimes forgotten that. You know, the human at the centre of this is the most, that's the most sacred relationship. And those interactions are the moments where miracles occur. What we can use, I'm not saying they need to be replaced by digital, they can be profoundly enabled by digital. So I can actually make sure that that five minutes, I have, I'm the best informed as the practitioner to engage with that conversation because I've been digitally enabled with information or a decision support tool. I can visually see all of that complex record. So instead of my consultation being with me sitting there and someone tapping away, um, looking, trying to find my path from the last four years, it come, it's come to me in a visualized sense that's easy. I sit in factories every day where I talk to the CEO and he calls up on one screen a dashboard and he can tell me the health of his entire system on one dashboard. I want to live in a world where my GP calls up my dashboard and can very easily see where I need to really spend those sacred precious moments together. Uh, so quickly some takeaways. At the beginning of everything, put the human at the centre. Put, uh, put that deep person and respect their, their um, need for choice, respect their need for that, it's, that they're a, a very important part of this journey. 
Patients are not things we process. They are human beings that are part and they need to be partners in these journeys because they leave our practices and our places and live a life. And we need to empower them to, to manage that life in a way that produces well-being. Digital is definitely the enabler. Um, the system's thinking, let's not lose that. And let's think trans-agency. If I can leave you with one thing, think bold and think outside the boundaries of where you're empowered to, to do your work today. Because it's in those joining up of those boundaries that, um, you know, the, we sat with the Premier the other day and they were talking about universities wanted some more money to create some more entrepreneurs so that we could, you know, grow the economy in Queensland. They said, let's give the university some more money. And I said, you know, I suspect there's probably more entrepreneurs in prison and in the headmaster's office than there might be inside of giving more money to our universities. Uh, and on the back of that comment two months ago, I now have the Morris brothers are actually doing the first startup weekend for kids at risk that have just come out of um, their first turn into juvenile justice. And we will do a business model of how um, car stealing and theft is valid entrepreneurial skills, but they're just in a profoundly broken model that will lead them to trouble. And that's getting a lot of traction. So it's about how do we use those great skills. Um, get really good on problem definition, but also think about the opportunities. Uh, really allow people that are not within your domain to come and visit and share. You know, the pain in my system is this. And ask, you know, ask people that are somewhere between 12 and 20 that don't have any knowledge of your system and ask them how they would solve that problem. And, and we find a lot of the new ingenuity is coming from that. Um, if I could leave with one thing, and, and because today is such a great audience on that, really collaborate. You know, find if there's universities, maybe it's not the whole university that you can collaborate because they tend to be very big, you know, difficult. Find that one practitioner that's in there researching and go and support them. Have a meeting, have a coffee and make something happen. It's through these transformative ways that we have. We have a centre here at QT we're just anchoring and we're starting to collaborate called Senior Living Innovation. And that's about how we live into our older lives. We've also got the largest startup in that sector that's just got $7 million from Seven West Media, which is called Starts at 60. And that's a whole digital portal that says, I'm 60 and I'm over, I'm not 60 yet, but I will be shortly, um, I'm over getting incontinence ads and ads about retirement villages, right? So it's all about how do we talk to an audience that's really diverse. So thank you very much. I'm very open source, so if you want to find me, find me on LinkedIn, link up. Um, let's get some movements happening and let's take some of this mindset back to your practices every day and really let's make some magic happen. Thank you.